have a lot to talk about with you. It's been a while. And then while. we're, we're going to take some questions too. But I do want to go back to that grade point average, that uh, <laughs> point oh eight. I don't. <laughs> I have a feeling there's an inspirational story in here, but I'd kind of like to know what turned that around to where you're sitting right here. Political philosophy. Um, I told this story before. The first book I ever read, I somehow managed to graduate from high school <laughs> without ever reading a book uh, cover to cover. And uh, the first book I ever read cover to cover was Plato's Republic. And um, the question is asked, what is justice? And school is essentially a lot of questions, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, questions about math, questions about history, questions about the uh, thesis of, uh, of a man for all seasons, right? It's just mm -hmm. a series of questions. But that question seemed to resonate with me, that question about what, what the nature of justice is. Grew up in a, in a family, uh, I had five of my cousins were killed in gang violence. Grew up in, a, in a, a community where at times there weren't a lot of jobs and opportunities. I worked in factories and warehouses and saw how people were treated and mistreated in, in those types of environment. And this very fundamental question of what is justice, what, is, what does this mean that was asked 21 centuries ago, um, very much resonated with me. It was, like I said, I'd never read a book cover to cover, but I got to that one one, uh, I got to that one question on page 31, uh, book one, part one, Plato's Republic. I got to that one question and I, I thought, I'm gonna turn the page. And I, I kept turning the page and I got to the end of that book and, and, uh, and many others since. You know there's not a parent in California whose stomach doesn't churn when their kid says, I'm gonna major in <laughs> philosophy. And they say there's no jobs in that, you'll never amount to anything, and all you'll do is sit around talking about justice all day. Will you be willing to go on a speaker's tour <laughs> of that? I just met a, a, a bank vice president who uh, studied philosophy as well. Um, so at least there's two of us. <laughs> you and I had a conversation at Cal State Fullerton where we were both teaching, and you told me you were thinking of running for office. Right. You had been an activist, you had been a teacher, all of these things. That's a big change. What, what got you to do that? We were having coffee at, at Carl's Jr. We were. I oh. said, I'm gonna run for uh, <laughs> state assembly. I was hoping you'd talk me out of it, you didn't. Um, I ran a, a series of nonprofit organizations, as you know, but I was an adjunct at Fullerton mm -hmm. as well. And the last nonprofit I ran, imagine running a nonprofit where you uh, employ about 600 people, you take care of about 2,200 children on a daily basis. You go to sleep on June 30th, and uh, that's the end of the fiscal year for the state. Fall asleep on June 30th. When you fall asleep on June 30th, you are reimbursed, for each child you educate, you're reimbursed $31 per child per day. So the state gives you $31 per child per day. On June 30th, that was my reality. When I woke up on July 1st, because of budget cuts, Rather than being reimbursed $31 per child per day, I was reimbursed $17 per child per day. Mm -hmm. And I had the same, you have to maintain the same child to teacher ratios. You have to maintain uh, the same collective bargaining agreement. You have the same rents, the same contracts in place. And we all understand that budget cuts are a reality. We all understand that the economy fluctuates, it goes up, it goes down. But I had this belief then, and I have this belief now, that the early childhood education programs that I was running were having a profound impact on people's lives. The very things that we want state institutions, such as the Cal State system, such as the Pat Brown Institute, the very systems that we want to have the most transformative impacts on people's lives, I, I believe that I was running one of those programs. And when I started going to Sacramento and asking why is my funding essentially cut in half, I didn't like the answers I got. I thought the answers were, uh, were, were, not, uh, were not what they should be. Um, I did follow a friend there um, prior to, uh, I think three or four years prior to my going to Sacramento, Holly Mitchell went there. Uh, State Senator Holly Mitchell went to Sacramento, first in the Assembly, now in the State Senate. She and I met through uh, our activism over early childhood education. She was running uh, Crystal Stairs, which is the largest African-American early childhood education program in LA, and I was running uh, the largest Latino nonprofit organization. 
So there were, there were other activists who created a pathway for me. Was it a tough election, your first election? No. It's pretty easy, <laughs> as I recall, wasn't I was, it? I was pretty fortunate. It was an interesting year. It was, and I'm joined by my colleague, Ed Chow, here, a good, good, very good friend and colleague, Ed Chow, who represents the San Gabriel Valley, had a much tougher path than I did. Um, Ed had a tough primary and a tough general election. I was really fortunate. It was 2012, which was the first year under the 2010 census uh, districts. Correct. So I ended up in a district where uh, one member decided to run for Senate. Uh, some other folks who we thought were going to run ended up running in another district. I ended up uh, not having that, that difficult a, 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 uh, an election. Now, you have a reputation for being just a really nice guy. It's not a political science term. You're just a really nice guy. When you became speaker, Dan Walters wrote an article that said, can a nice guy like Rendon run California's assembly? It's an interesting question. On the other hand, as soon as you got there, you ran for speaker pretty quickly. I did. So what was that all about? That's a pretty big decision for an, a freshman to make to it run was. for speaker. I was sworn in in December of 2012, and a year later, I was already running for speaker. Um, it was an interesting time. We, I am, Mr. Chow and I are part of the, the first of the 12-year class. Uh, we're going to be, in, because of term limit extensions, we're going to be, we have the opportunity to be in office for 12 years. Prior to 2012, the longest you could serve was six years in the legislature. Um, so there was a feeling among folks in our class that, that we would pick one of our own. We would pick somebody who was going to be there for a long time. We would pick somebody who was part of our class uh, rather than having someone from one of the previous classes who was only, unfortunately, going to be able to be there for a couple of years. So there was a small group of us uh, in, in my class who got together and said, yeah, it should be one of us. And they pointed the fingers the wrong way. Um, and, and they came to me. But um, yeah, it was, I ran for speaker and lost the first time around. But I learned, learned quite a bit about it. About, uh, about the process. Were some people pretty angry at you for doing that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think there was a sense. And the, we ended up picking a, a speaker who was uh, from the previous class. She wasn't angry. She, mm -hmm. she understood. <laughs> um, but uh, I think there were, there were people who thought that there, there should be a, a more natural flow from the then senior class to the junior class and then eventually to our class. So this was the revolt of the new kids on the block. It was the revolt Sacramento. of the new kids on the block. And those new kids on the block are going to run the legislature for years to come. Would that be pretty we're accurate? We're going to be there for another eight and a half years. So just to remind everybody, the previous term limits law was three terms in the assembly and two terms in the Senate. Yes. So a maximum of eight years and under the new law, 12 years maximum and you can serve it all in one house if you want. Right, so you can do six, six two-year terms in the assembly, you can do four, I'm really bad at math, four, four, four three-year ter three, three, four year four year terms, terms in the That was one of those Senate. grade point averages. It, it okay. was, yeah, okay. clear. You, yeah. you <laughs> clearly know which classes <laughs> I didn't God pass. For philosophy, exactly. Right? exactly. No yeah. numbers in philosophy, <laughs> we like that. Mm -hmm. So we talked about this once, the, the people who are gonna serve in the legislature now are gonna be really different from the people we've been used to for the last 20 years or Absolutely. so who have been short timers, basically. Right. What's the difference going to be? Well, a lot. I mean, first of all, like we, we have Ed Chow here. Ed Chow is the head of our, uh, the chair of our privacy committee, which if you start thinking about the extent to which technology is changing and you think of uh, fraud relating to internet uh, theft and those types of things, to have someone in that position for an extended period of time continually working on public policy relating to that area to have somebody working on education policy for a decade, to have somebody working on energy policy for a decade, to have somebody working on uh, environmental policy for a decade in that same position, talking about solutions, talking about what has been tried before and what has perhaps failed, talk about what has uh, been tried before and has succeeded. To be able to have that continuity, I think, can only be a good thing. And the analogy I always use when, whenever I talk about term limits is, would you want to go to a dentist who could only serve for six years? Would you want to give your car to a mechanic who said, I've only been doing this for three years. I don't know. It looks like a muffler. Um, <laughs> this, I think developing a level of expertise, whether it's dentistry or public policy, is a good thing. 
So every speaker finds their own style. And it's worth reminding those of you who are new to the system that the speaker is initially selected by the caucus of the majority party. And then there's a formal vote of the whole assembly. Right. Is that right? Right. So how many votes did you need when you were elected to have your majority? We, there's another math question. Sorry about that. Uh, there are 52 members of our caucus. Half was 26, but you can't win with half, so I needed 27. Okay. And I then there's a right. formal vote. That was excellent. Then there's <laughs> a formal you. vote after that. There's and a formal everybody, vote. And the whole right. caucus votes together. And everybody together. votes, and the Republicans vote, and everybody's happy. Except right. there was a funny time in, uh, in California's history that's very meaningful to you because it was your, Absolutely. in an odd kind of way, your role model when right. Willie Brown upset the apple cart. Right. And you read about Willie Brown in a Cal State Fullerton class, right? With Dr. Yinger. Uh, yes, I was living in Whittier. I would take a series of buses to Cal State Fullerton. Uh, you have to take one to Brea, you have to take another one to Fullerton. At getting uh, to Cal State uh, was kind of a chore, particularly when you're not all that motivated and not a great student. Um, but there was one class I had, it was an 8 a.m. class. So imagine what time you had to get on the bus to get to Fullerton at 8 a.m. from Fuller, from uh, Whittier. So an 8 a.m. class was a class in California politics. That semester that I took a class in California politics, I got a D, an F, an F, and a C. I excelled in California politics, I got a C. <coughs> and the reason I think I did so well was because it was this, it was like a novella, it was this ongoing soap opera. Um, <laughs> Willie Brown, incredible personality, incredible style, incredible um, in every respect. Incredible communicator. Willie Brown was speaker. Uh, George Duke Majin was governor. Total contrasts. Very different people. Um, and to sort of engage in that on a daily, go to class every day in the way that Dr. Yinger, who you knew, who you know, uh, the way he taught the class was always sort of half gossip. It was sort of, <laughs> here's the book, but I know this really happened. And I'd go every day and I'd get there and it was sort of, it was almost like, like, oh, class is over. I want to see what's going to happen tomorrow. It was this incredible story of, 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 of this leader, of, of, the, of this leader who is really sort of engaged on a policy level, but also engaged in terms of leadership and sort of leading his caucus and leading the legislature toward achieving some pretty impressive goals. So yeah, I mean, that had a transformative effect on me. And it was neat at Cal State Fullerton to study that at Cal State Fullerton because I, uh, you taught, you, you wrote, uh, the first person I ever, the first time I ever voted was in 1986. Mm -hmm. uh, I voted for, for Tom Bradley for governor. Just missed. Yeah. Um, you wrote the best book that I think has ever been written about, about Bradley, um, Politics of Black and White, available at the bookstore. <laughs> $12.99? Uh, oh, a lot more. He'll autograph it. He'll autograph it for it's you. It's a thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you were, you were there at, at, at Fullerton, and, and there was this class going on, and it was the Cal State system, and it was this, this really sort of exciting time. Barbara Stone was there, and she was an arch conservative, and she hated Willie Brown, and Yinger loved Willie Brown, and it was just, it was a fantastic time. It was an exciting time for California politics. So, speaking of exciting times for California politics, if you look at the last month in California government up to today, when you were with the governor signing this historic agreement. Right. This may have been one of the most consequential legislative sessions in decades. Um, and that's part of what we wanted to talk about, especially about climate change. Not just about climate change, but because I think people need to know the coalition that came together, perhaps for the first time in California, to overcome internal disagreements on environmental issues. So first, can you just tell everybody what the bill does? Sure. And then let's talk about how that came together. Sure, SB 32 uh, sort of renews our commitment to reducing greenhouse gases. It actually ups the ante um, in terms of our, our commitment to reducing greenhouse gases as a, as a state and uh, reducing climate change and reducing the harmful pollutants that we breathe every day. Um, the bill went up for a vote last year. It failed miserably. And there were reports, I mean, keep in mind that California is the sort of world leader on, in terms of this commit, uh, in terms of our commitment to battling uh, climate change. And for that bill to fail so miserably last year, um, sent sort of shockwaves literally throughout the world. 
Um, the bill, the program wasn't expiring yet, so the fact that we didn't do it last year wasn't, wasn't the end of the program. Uh, we knew we had to get it done uh, sooner rather than later. And it all, like all good uh, stories, it, it begins in Paris. Um, last year, <laughs> last year I went, uh, Annie and I went uh, to the climate conference in, in Paris and the governor was there, uh, Fran Pavley was there. Uh, Fran Pavley, Senator Pavley is the author of AB 32, which was our initial commitment to climate change. And uh, Richard Bloom was there. There were a lot of other members of the legislature there, but there's, there's one guy who went, a guy by the name of Eduardo Garcia, who represents a Coachella Valley. Eduardo, uh, fellow UCR graduate, very underassuming, very uh, modest uh, gentleman who did not vote for SB 32 last year, and that's an important part of the story. And Eduardo was there at this International Climate Change Conference, and I spent, the, the, it was right after the attacks in Paris. So the, when you have an image of Paris, you have you know, the beautiful image of, of the river and the Eiffel Tower and everything, it's Christmas time, and it's beautiful. But that's not where the conference was. The conference was at this horrible exposition center a good 30 miles out of town because it would, they were trying to make sure it was uh, secure from, uh, that there was enough security. So every morning, Eduardo Garcia and I would get on this bus and we'd drive out, out into the suburbs of Paris. And I, was, I knew the guy pretty well. We had served together for a year, but he had voted against SB 32 and I was a little, I was curious about his commitment to climate change. And in those bus rides and in those days that we'd, sp we'd spend you know, eight to five uh, all day long at this, at this, uh, at this uh, convention, at this climate conference, start to hear him talk about the impact of, of, of pollutants, uh, of, of asthma, for example, in his district, and the way he had sort of understood the issue as very much a local issue, as something that was important to him. And his, he told me during those conversations that he, he, had been opposed to SB, he hadn't been opposed to SB 32, he just felt that he wanted the dialogue to kind of continue. And after about four days of being in, in, um, in Paris with Eduardo, um, he, he, one day, one afternoon, he said, hey, hey, bro, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. I'm going to go over here, bro. I was like, all right. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, Annie travels with me a lot. She gets tired of me. I understand that, right? People, I thought, all right, he needs, he needs some Eduardo time, right? <laughs> Eduardo needs some time on his own. So he's like, I got to go over here. I said, all right, go over there. And I didn't know what he was doing. And, and I passed, I thought I'd spy on him. So I... I <laughs> passed by this conference room kind of like this, and he's sitting up here on a stage giving a presentation to a, in, the International Climate Conference. Eduardo Garcia is giving a speech. I thought, wow, this guy is fascinating. Um, but he's also modest. He didn't want me to know, right? He was pretending like he was going to the bathroom or something. <laughs> but he was, he was speaking to people in 30 different languages. And, and he was there with these international, these, MIT professors and Fran Pavley and, and I thought this is a really remarkable guy. And he started at the first uh, of this year and said I, I want to work on, on SB 32 and I, I told Senator Pavley, I said this guy's special and he gets it and he cares and it's local and it matters to him and it matters to his community. And every single day he just kept plugging away, kept plugging away, talking to members, going into their offices, talking about climate change. Yeah, he talked about polar bears. He talked about it on a, on, a, on a large global level, but he also talked about what it meant in people's district, what it means in Ed Chow's district, which is intersected by the 10 and the, and the well, not intersected by the 7 10. That's a point of contentious. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's right. intersected by the 10 freeway and this sort of impact of and what it means in people's you know, everyday lives. And, he just kept plugging away at it. And I, I, know, I'm, I know this is a really long answer, so it's I apologize. Mm -hmm. But there was this point about two months ago, and James Johnson for the California League of Conservation Voters is here, and the environmental folks made a huge lift on this as well. There was this point in the last month where I became almost sort of paternalistic. Like, I didn't, I didn't want Eduardo to be let down. I knew he'd put a lot of work into it. And I said, hey, this doesn't have to, be, this doesn't have, to happen this year. Maybe it'll happen next year. And he's like, okay, bro, okay, I get it. But he didn't, he just kept going. He kept plugging away. And then one day he tells me, I'm at 38 votes. I'm at 39 votes. I'm at 40 votes. And he kept plugging it away. Jimmy Gomez, who represents a local community, 
he was involved in it. And he kept just like the Energizer bunny, bunny right? He just kept plugging away. The vote went up. I think we ended up 44, 44 votes. And it was this one guy, this, this one, I mean, it was a team, obviously, but this one guy who sort of instilled the spirit of, of what this issue means on a global level, but also in his district and in 80 districts throughout the, throughout the, uh, throughout the, the state. And it's early. The governor signed the bill three, years, uh, three hours ago, so it's still, the ink is still, hasn't dried yet. But that effort and California's renewed commitment to climate change, that's, that's a story of one guy really, really potentially changing the world. It's a story of one guy who's really saying, like, I'm going to keep working, I'm going to keep plugging away, and having an impact that, is, I mean, you pick up any newspaper throughout the world, they're talking about this bill. It's a little bigger than that, isn't it? Because there had been a rather narrow coalition oh. on environmental issues, Heck you yeah. know, in your organization before you remember the assembly. It was perceived as kind of an issue not for working class communities, not for communities of color to have a leadership role in. And yet most of the environmental impacts that we see, as in your district, you've talked about with me, hit home in those districts. This is an extraordinary development, I would say. It, it's absolutely extraordinary. What we, you know, in, in Los Angeles, we call this sort of east side enviro versus the west right. side enviro. This is the, you know, the, the, the merging of the two with Fran Pavley from the Senate and Eduardo Garcia uh, from Coachella Valley. This is the sort of new environmentalism. I represent a district that is intersected by dozens of freeway, groundwater contamination, uh, 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 smog, uh, unbelievable levels of smog. And when you look at public opinion polls, look at the PPIC polls on climate change, look at the PPIC polls on uh, need for parks, look on the climate change for, on, on the uh, PPIC polls for virtually any environmental indicator. It's people of color, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Pacific Islanders who, are, who want these programs the most, who worry the most about climate change, who worry the most about a lack of park space, who worry the most about groundwater contamination. Yet the environmental community has, for a long time, been dominated by West Side uh, uh, people who are, are, are not people of color. So this victory of uh, this SB 32 victory in AB 197, which is a companion bill, is really it's symbolic, but it's actually it's a a real victory as well, and it's it can only be great for the environmental movement. So to help us understand something about legislation in the real world, you've always got to think about the governor. 44 votes is not enough if the governor doesn't, the governor's about to look at, what, 780 bills yep. that are put before the governor? If the governor vetoes it, 44 votes is not enough to override a veto. Right. How did you stay in touch with the governor throughout this process to know that he didn't think it was moving too quickly, that it shouldn't move to next year? Because this governor has a very acute sense of timing yes. about what should happen. So you had Eduardo on one place and Jerry somewhere else yes. with you. Yes, yeah. And Kevin DeLeon in the right, Senate. Right, exactly. Um, this, I think what's a little bit different about this bill, I mean, the, you mentioned the 700 bills that we put on the governor's desk. With respect to 750 of them, you put them on his desk and you have no idea what he's going to do. <laughs> um, this is one of those issue areas where he, was, he wanted us to do this and he was sort of pushing us along. And he's, he's an international climate champion. He was... Uh, he was speaking in, uh, in Paris as well. He wasn't hiding it uh, like Eduardo was. Um, but, I mean, this issue meant a lot to him. So we were uh, constantly checking in with him on the bill. I think where the big point of contention was, and again, the bills were linked. So there was SB 32, which upped our commitment to reducing greenhouse gases. But there was also AB 197, which said we're going to have uh, more legislative control over the California mm -hmm. Air Resources Board. And that cuts into the governor's power, because that's right. the legislative branch saying, hey, we need to look at what you guys are doing in the executive branch. So yeah, he was probably pretty ornery about, about 197. But I think the beauty of what Eduardo was doing was in talking to all of these members, especially members who didn't vote for SB 32 last year, he was saying, why didn't you vote for SB 32 last year? And they would say, because we don't believe the California Air Resources Board has enough oversight. We don't believe that we have enough input uh, in, into what CARB is doing. So 197 developed out of that. That was Eduardo's contribution. That was Eduardo saying, I'm listening to you. 
I'm listening to the members of the legislature. I understand what you're talking about. So it was something that was to an extent antithetical to, to what perhaps the governor wanted, but I think Eduardo, through the process, through that sort of dialogue, the political need for it kind of developed. Well, you said something that really struck me as interesting. You said on about 750 of those bills, you don't have a clue what the governor's going right. to do. Now, if you don't know, <laughs> uh, how do you find out? Do your members call you and say, find out? I'm worried. I put this, I spent a year on this bill. What's the governor going to do? How do you, do you really just wait until you see at the end of the month what he's going to do? Uh, or do you, uh, is there a process that you have with the governor? All, all the above. Um, I, there is, I mean, the individual members check in with the governor when they're, hopefully, uh, when they're working on the legislation, they, they say, this is what I'm working on, what are you thinking? Um, the governor and his staff can sometimes be coy, and that's, their, that's up to them. Mm -hmm. they, they can do that if they want. Um, in other instances, the governor and his staff will offer suggestions. Well, we might be willing to be receptive to it if it looked like a little bit like this, and we really hate this, and we're not sure about this. So with a lot of those bills, you have a sense if you're sort of in the ballpark. That being said, the governor is a wonderfully unpredictable person. Um, I, there were a couple of bills I had. I thought, wow, I did everything he wanted. <laughs> so now I vetoed him anyway. Um, but that, that keeps us honest. So does it help that you both like to read philosophy? It does. We read different philosophy. He reads dead guys only. <laughs> um, I, I, like, I like 20th century philosophy. He, he did give me, he gave me an article from um, some professor at Stanford that he had met. And in exchange, I give him a copy of my dissertation, which is <laughs> political theory. Um, and I asked him, I, I saw him about three weeks ago. I said, have you read my dissertation? And he said, have you read my article? Um, I said, no. And he said, well, he said, I opened your dissertation. It's about 200 pages. And he said, the article I gave you is just 30. <laughs> so I think I got to do, I think I got to make the first move on so you that. have some work to do <laughs> yeah, on this do. relationship. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would you say is another major accomplishment legislatively? Then I'm going to ask you about something that didn't go through. That okay. I'd like to know about. But go ahead. What, what do you think, what else would you rank as extremely significant? Well, you know, the, the sort of um, back and forth dialogue that's going on right now, someone in, in my office called this the most successful history, uh, successful session in the history of the legislature. I think, I think it was. I think it was the most progressive session in the history of the legislature. Not only uh, did we re-up re our commitment to cutting greenhouse gases, we increased the minimum wage uh, to $15, first state in the country to do that. We beat New York by about 12 hours. <laughs> um, we um, passed farm worker overtime. It took 78 years to get that done, but we passed farm worker overtime. We eliminated the maximum family grant, which essentially punished uh, uh, mothers uh, on welfare from having, uh, for having additional children. We passed five anti-tobacco bills. We fast passed five uh, restrictive gun bills. My staff always tells me not to use the word restrictive gun bills, but they're restrictive, and that's why they're good. <laughs> um, we passed five uh, really tough gun bills. So we, we had an incredible year. We, we had a, a, an incredibly remarkable year. It's hard to, to, uh, to choose any one of those issues, but I think perhaps the $15 minimum wage has will have ultimately, ultimately the largest impact on the, the most amount of people. And the sort of back and forth that we're having right now is Sherry Jeffy Bebich at, at USC uh, said in response to our staff, she said, uh, no, there was a, a year during the height of the civil rights movement when the UNRU uh, Civil Rights Act was passed. And that was a more progressive uh, session than this year it was. And, you know what, if that's the argument. That was way far back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the argument is between civil rights and the stuff we did this year, then if we finish second, that's okay. If we fin I'm still going to argue that we're, we were more progressive, but either way, we did great. Can I tell you something weird that I've noticed about the state government these days? Years ago, there was a lot of media coverage in Sacramento. Yeah. There was TV up there. there I mean, in addition to the good newspaper coverage, the TV stations had people yep. set up there. Then they all started to drift away, except for a short period of time when Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. Right. Then they came back for a while because he was kind of wildly entertaining. Right. Then when he left, they sort of disappeared. I read more about what you're doing in the New York Times and sometimes 
in the international press because yeah. of things like the climate change than we do. Is there any way, do you think, to get us a greater eye into what's going on up there, given the, this is the biggest state in the union, and right. possibly driving the agenda of the country right now, but without much media attention? 38.5 million people are bigger than <coughs> literally most European countries. Um, is there a way, I mean, I, I think a lot of that is the, the way that the media works today. I mean, there are blogs and other sort of untraditional um, news outlets that cover us quite a bit. But yeah, I mean, in terms of the mainstream press, you, you just don't see it uh, as much anymore. It's interesting when you stand in the back of the chambers, they have, they still have the, the placards for all the, the newspapers that used to be there, the Fresno Bee, the, all those things. They're usually half empty, your staff is sitting there. Um, but yeah, I mean, the bureaus have, have closed to a large extent. Um, I don't know how to increase um, how to increase that attention other than doing something, uh, some sort of ridiculous stunt. I'll, I'll, we can choreograph that if you'd like. <laughs> um, but I, I, when I used to teach at, at Fullerton, I used to always tell people that there's an incredible amount of attention that's paid toward national politics. Fine, it's very important, it has an impact on your lives. We can see what Supreme Court decisions uh, have meant for, for our lives. Um, but ultimately, the decisions that really impact your life on a day-to-day -day basis occur at the city council level, at the school board level, at the water district level. They're much more localized. And, and I think, um, to a large extent, uh, at the state level as well, with respect to school funding and, and, and all these other programs. So I, I don't know how to increase uh, attention, but uh, it's a shame. You know this state is doing as much as anybody to increase voter participation, yeah. especially among the young. I mean, really path-breaking stuff. In 2018, when there's not a presidential election, there's every reason to think that young voters, communities of color, others, working class voters will not turn out in those elections. Is there anything you think we can do that all elected officials, that all of us can be doing to prevent the false positive of this year because it's going to look really good this year. It's going to look like people are really excited. Right. And then they're going to disappear. Right. No, you're, you're exactly right. And that's, unfortunately, that's built into our campaign models. I mean, we've, we're looking at uh, the November elections, obviously. We've been working hard on, on those. And the projections of what we expect voter turnout to be in November versus what it was two years ago versus what it, was, what it is going to be in a couple of years are dramatically different, sadly different. Um, I think a lot of what we're doing as the legislature, if I can tout us, um, could be helpful. I think these types of forums engaging in civic participation and really just honestly telling the California story. I'm going to DC in a few weeks. I'm going to talk to a couple of groups there about what we've been doing in California uh, in terms of sort of the way we're, we're, we're leading the way. I think that's incredibly important, telling the story of California. Earlier during my introduction, I talked about the water bond. Mm -hmm. And the way that bonds have traditionally been done is the, the big, the leaders, the speaker, the pro tem, the governor, when the Republicans were more prominent, the minority leaders would get in the back room and they'd say, well, here's the bond we're going to negotiate and it'll look like this. And they take it out to the membership and they all vote for it. We didn't do it that way because of my district, because of the problems relating to a lack of transparency and accountability in my district. We wanted to do things different. We wanted to do things in a very different and unique way. If you look at our transportation chair, Jim Frazier, who's working on a, tra a similar transportation bond, he's doing that bond in a very similar way. He was down at the LA Chamber of Commerce recently at a, 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 an event a forum to talk about how that's done. If you look at the way, again, Eduardo Garcia mm -hmm. tackled the park bond, it's the same way. It's these sort of having these conversations out in the open and making sure that people really understand that their, that their vote really does matter. Before we take some questions, you, you, you mentioned something about Republicans in California, and I wanted to ask you about your view, because you work with a lot of Republicans, even though you're the, uh, elected by the Democratic Caucus. This was a state that was highly competitive 25, 30 years ago. In fact, no governor who was a Democrat in modern times who wasn't named Brown or worked for Brown had been elected governor. Right. Um, the presidential, until 1992, the state leaned Republican in presidential races. They often controlled the legislature. Right. Willie Brown's genius was maneuvering around the balanced parties. Now you have essentially a one-party government. Right. 
Um, what, what's your feeling about what it's like to be a Republican in the legislature these days? Well, um, <laughs> first of all, your, your point is well taken. I mean, I'm 48 years old. Um, I've lived the majority of my life as a Calif the majority of my life has been spent under Republican governors. Mm -hmm. So the extent to which you know, we were uh, a bipartisan or even Republican state, I think that's sometimes overlooked. I mean, it's, uh, it, it wasn't that long ago. Um, what's interesting about, to answer your question um, with respect to folks in my class, for example, there's, there seems to be these sort of two dynamics. Um, there are some incredibly conservative Republicans mm -hmm. who really don't have a whole heck of a lot to lose, and they can say whatever they want, and that's probably pretty fun. If I were them, it'd be fun. You can be as outrageous as you want. And we have certainly that sort of a, a contingent in the Republican caucus in Sacramento. But you have another group, and you keep in mind in my class in 2012, I think what's happened in, in the Republican Party in California is the party mechanisms have been so decimated and the party has declined so much that in 2012, when the, the freshman, uh, our freshman class mm -hmm. came into power and uh, got elected, there were a bunch of Republican freshmen who had not been endorsed by the Republican Party. There were a bunch of Republicans who had, beat, who, who had defeated Republican endorsed candidates. So they got to Sacramento and the Republican Party said, well, hey, why don't you take the no tax pledge? And they're like, well, I'm not going to listen to you. You guys, <laughs> you guys were trying to de defeat me a few months ago. So there's a wildly independent group of Republicans, uh, whether they're moderate or still conservative, but, but sort of independent of the party uh, structures and party mechanisms. Um, I've gone, I think, twice up to the northeastern edge of California to spend time at Brian Dolly's ranch. He's a guy who understands uh, the environment, a guy who understands forestry, a guy who understands the impact that all of that has on, on climate change. Proud Republican, I'd probably even call him a conservative Republican, but we worked on a, a biomass bill together at the end of session that was successful. Think of like Brian Mainsheim down in San Diego who served on the uh, City of San Diego Homeless, uh, Homeless Commission for some time, uh, served at the United Way uh, of San Diego who really understands social service delivery systems the way that I do. So there's a number of Republicans in, that, uh, that I'm happy to work with and that we do work with effectively well. So if some of the students in this room asked you why they should care about all the stuff that we're talking about, what would you say to them? Um, I've got an audience here, they're not going anywhere. Um, I'd ask them. Uh, I would say because it directly impacts your life. When I first started, to, this is gonna make everybody feel, it's gonna make me feel old and it's gonna make some of you feel very, very sad. When I first started <laughs> taking classes at Cal State Fullerton, my tuition was $283 a semester. <laughs> um, the decisions that were made that led to tuition being what it is today were made by people who serve in the office that I serve in now. They were made by people who, these, these are not decisions made by computers. These are not decisions that are sort of naturally manifest from some sort of logarithm. These are decisions that are made by people. Um, if you're, you feel that your roads are crumbling, if you feel like your water systems are crumbling, if you feel um, like you don't get the representation you need, that's a, a reason to, to be involved in, in California government, in government in general. And you know, during the course of my life, and today was interesting because we were at this park for the bill signing, uh, about a half a mile from, from downtown Los Angeles. I remember my, da my dad grew up in Los Angeles. I remember him telling me, he said, like, oh, when I was a kid, the smog was so terrible. He'd say, you know, I'd, he said, I'd sit in the top of the Coliseum and you'd look down and you'd see this film of smog over, you know, between where I was sitting and in the field. And when he would say that, I'd look up, at, try to look up at the mountains. And I couldn't see the mountains. And I'd think, how? How could smog have been worse back then in the 1950s than, they are, than it was in the 1980s when he was telling me this? You can see the mountains now. You really can. Um, we have some smoggy days. We have some really smoggy days. But what, what you see in terms of, in terms of our, our air quality, I mean, when's the last time we had a, 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 a third stage smog alert? It, 
the number of, I can't remember the data anymore, they've decreased by X hundred percent. Um, those are decisions that were made by real people who, who sat in these offices and were elected to these positions and have had a positive impact on, on our state. Have, they, have we done everything we need to do? Oh, hell no, <laughs> not even close. Um, but the involvement, the election of, of people uh, to office has, has a real impact on your lives. It feels sometimes like an uphill battle these days for democracy to make its case here and around the world. But what you said, to see an example where something dramatic changed because of democracy is really important. But to make you a little bit younger, could you share your favorite music taste with the audience? What I'm listening to right now, um, I like Bright Eyes a lot. Um, what else do I like? I like I'm into anything Irish. Um, <laughs> There's a great, I have X, I, well, I don't have, my wife has XM radio, it's in her car. Um, but occasionally when I drive it, um, there's a channel 35 is called University Radio. It's the, yeah, you know it? It's the <laughs> coolest thing, just put on, you put on U, UXM and then just uh, Shazam every song that they play because it's pretty amazing. I just want to tell you I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and I have drawn the conclusion that after all these years of our being friends that you are way cooler <laughs> than I am, which is extremely disappointing to me. But it's a reality we all have to face. Um, I'd like to take some questions if that's cool. okay.